The Secret of Nim is a 1982 animated film which was produced by Aurora Productions and directed by the legendary Don Bluth, to which this film is actually his first time in the director's chair. The backstory to this film and Don Bluth is quite an interesting one, as this film is basically Don Bluth's way of giving Disney the middle finger. But first, a word from our sponsor. Ah, oh, for the love of crumb cake. Raid Shadow Legends. Have you heard about them? Raid is a turn-based RPG which can be played on both the Android and iOS devices. I even downloaded it myself and genuinely found myself to be having some fun. Ooh. Oh shit. Can we show you that? He did. Huh. And the best part is, it's completely free. So you've really got nothing to lose. It has decent graphics for a mobile game, PvP battles, a campaign story, giant boss fights, and raids you can carry out with other players. Every month the game will add more than 14 new champions, meaning the gameplay stays fresh as you can play with new strategies and balance, and completing certain missions to help give you progression rewards. But you don't have to take my word for it, as there are currently 15 million other people who have downloaded the game and it is currently one of the top 3 ranked RPGs on the Google Play Store. So if you want to give it a go, click my personal link in the description below to not only get the game, but to also receive an extra 50,000 silver. Plus a free epic champion as part of the new player program they're testing. Thank you so much for watching guys, and thank you to Raid for sponsoring this video. Now back to the review. You see, Don Bluth used to work for Disney, first starting in 1955, where he began as an animation assistant for Sleeping Beauty. He then left after two years, but returned again in 1971, where he worked on numerous animated films such as Robin Hood, The Rescuers, and Peep's Dragon. I can't believe you've done this. But as the years went on, Don Bluth became increasingly frustrated with Disney, claiming he was not happy with how the Disney company was being run, and that their attempts to continually cut cost was ruining their animations. So in 1979, Bluth and a team of other animators decided to leave the studio and set out to start their own. The goal of Don Bluth's studio was to return animation back to the quality it held during the golden era with an emphasis on strong characters and story, as well as experimenting with more traditional but also more labour intensive animation techniques. And though the studio had done a couple of animated shorts such as Banjo the Woodpile Cat, Banjo's the cat who could not behave, he seldom did what he should. The Secret of Nim was to be their first full length animated feature. So was it a success? Did it manage to give Disney the finger? Let's take a look. The film opens with a mysterious figure writing into a magical book about the recent death of his friend, Jonathan Brisby. Jonathan Brisby was killed today while helping with the plan. Oh, this is going to be an upbeat film, I can tell. We then cut away and get introduced to how his now widowed wife, Mrs. Brisby, and um, yep, Mrs. Brisby is how she's always referred to in the film. Mrs. Brisby is a mouse who lives on a farm with her four children. The youngest of them, Timmy, however, has fallen incredibly ill. So she seeks out help from another mouse named Mr. Ages to see if he can figure out how to cure him. And yep, Mr. Ages is how he is also referred to in the film. Mr. Ages diagnoses her child with pneumonia and makes up a medicine powder for her to give to him. Problem is though, that the medicine will take three weeks to cure her child, and in that time, he must stay inside and rested. The reason this is a problem is because spring is approaching, and once the frost clears from the field, the farmer will begin ploughing into them, to which her family will need to move location. As Mrs. Brisby is heading back to her home, she meets a crow named Jeremy. Do you like me? Of course I like you. Bye now. <sighs> My love life in a nutshell. 
whom she helps free from Tangled String in order to escape the farmer's cat, Dragon. Which actually reminds me a lot from the sharp tooth chase scene as we see in The Land Before Time. The next day, Brisby is informed by Auntie Shrew. Yep, and that is how she is referred to in this film, despite not being any blood relative. That the plow is set to start early this year. Desperate to think of something, Mrs. Brisby and the crow head over to see the grey owl. Uh, ow, uh, ow. In hope that he will have a solution to their problem. Why spiders? The owl tells her that she should seek help from the rats which live under the rose bush in the farmer's garden, as they may be able to help her move her home. Mrs. Brisby locates the rose bush, but is quickly chased away by a guard. Luckily though, she also happens to bump into Mr. Ages, who agrees to take her to see the leader of the rats, Nicodemus. What about the large rat at the entrance? I can't go back there. I can't. Oh, that's just Brutus. Oh yeah, just Brutus. That guy that says nothing and tries to savagely murder anyone that comes across his path. Classic Brutus. As they further in, Mrs. Brisby meets the captain of the guard, Justin. Who, I'm not really sure if there's meant to be a romantic element between these two. Kind of awkward considering she's a mouse and he's a rat, but I don't know. Mrs. Brisby presents her case to the council who initially reject her request, but after another rat named Jenna agrees to help, who definitely isn't secretly evil, the council rule in favour, and plan to help them move the house later that night. Mrs. Brisby then meets Nicodemus, who explains to her that the rat, Mr. Ages and her husband were once test subjects from a place known as NIM, which stands for National Institute of Mental Health. During the test, some of the creatures were injected with a serum which gave them enhanced intelligence, enabling them to escape. Why did he never tell me about any of you? Because the injections slowed the aging process. You would have grown old while he remained young. Hang on, yeah, that's a good point. I don't really see this as a valid reason for Jonathan not telling her. Surely if Jonathan wasn't going to age the same rate as her, she would begin to suspect something anyway the moment she starts to turn grey and wrinkled and he still looks exactly the same? Later that night, moving operation is underway. All appears to be going well until Jenna sabotages the plan by cutting the ropes lifting the house, I'm secretly evil. which ends up crushing Nicodemus. A fight ensues between Justin and Jenna with Jenna eventually falling after getting a knife thrown into his back by his ex-accomplice. But now that Jenna's all dead, all is now good and happy. But wait, it's not, as Mrs. Brisby's house begins sinking into the mud whilst her children and Auntie Shrew are still inside. All hope appears lost until the magic amulet given to Mrs. Brisby by Nicodemus is able to lift the house out of the mud and save everyone. Yeah, we'll, we'll get onto that in a tick. We cut forward to where the family are now settled in their new home, with Timmy now looking like he's recovering from the pneumonia. The crow manages to find the potential girl of his dreams, and the film credits roll. So that's the basic plot of Secret of Nim. What are my thoughts on it? Well, overall, I'd say this is a really good film, but not without its flaws. The plot is an interesting one. Despite being made for a family audience, this is actually a pretty dark film, with a lot of deaths, some scenes of animal testing, which gives me horrendous flashbacks to Plague Dogs and Felidae, brutal fight scenes, and even some blood for good measure. Looking at the setting of the film, despite it taking place on a farm with your typical farmland creatures, it has a very whimsical and fantasy feel to it, such as with the magical book, visual portal, and amulet. Now, don't get me wrong, I didn't mind the fancy elements in the film, but I'm not really sure what purpose they serve to the plot, nor do I see any reason as to why they exist, as this is all meant to be taking place in the real world, and the only real sci-fi element we get is that the rats gained intelligence, but nowhere is it mentioned about the ability of magic. The magical book is cool and all with its lighting and animation, 
but this magical element doesn't really serve any purpose. The visual portal thing, despite being able to spy on any character at any given time, is never really utilised, and the amulet given to Mrs. Brisby from Nicodemus kind of comes across as a Duke's Ex Machina plot device to suddenly save the day at the end. Then after that, Mrs. Brisby just gives it away to Justin off screen like it was no big deal at all. Miss Briz, let me have the sparkly. I gotta have the sparkly. I gave it to Justin. Justin? Who the heck is Justin? I don't know. I kind of got the impression that her husband's spirit was meant to be in there. Jonathan, wherever you are, your thoughts must comfort her tonight. And so it had a personal connection to her? And even if it doesn't, don't you think it would be wise to keep such a device around? You know, just in case anything bad like that should happen again in the future? What does work with the fantasy element, however, is the location design. Because each setting looks so drastically different, despite only being a few hundred meters apart, it really does make the film feel a lot grander and larger scale than it actually is. In fact, everything is made to feel like a grand scale here. The owl seems ginormous, and the chase scene with the cat looks about as epic as the sharp tooth chase scene from The Land Before Time. And that's cleverly done by using low angles to make the creatures on screen look bigger than they actually are. And that brings me smoothly onto the animation. As mentioned earlier, after their departure from Disney, Don Bluth and his team set out with the goal to return animation back to its golden era. To achieve this goal, Bluth wanted to go back to more traditional animated techniques which had been abandoned in more of the recent films. One of those techniques being rotoscoping, where animators will trace over live action footage in order to achieve a more realistic movement. The animation itself is very good. Characters are detailed, have fluid movement, and the action scenes are very intense. The majority of the film has a really dark palette to it. But to avoid it becoming dull and stale looking, the film gives us beautiful lighting throughout. These lighting techniques were actually achieved through one of the experimental animation styles I mentioned earlier. To achieve this, they would shine light through the colour gels as they were being snapped frame by frame, which would produce a glowing effect which is seen in numerous parts of the film. The lighting effect would also be used to convey subtle hints to characters and plot. Don Bluth stated in a 2007 DVD release that he wanted the Great Owl and Nicodemus to be seen as aspects of the same character as they both possess the same glowing eye effect. However, achieving this level of animation did come at a cost. A lot of cost. Costs that the film's budget couldn't afford to pay. So to keep the film budget under control, crew members would often be found working long hours. Producer Gary Goldman claimed that he'd be working 110 hour weeks during the final six months of production, which if we do our maths, would work out at nearly 16 hours a day. And that's including weekends. The music is also up there with the animation. The orchestra really complements the dramatic lighting and animation we see throughout. Prime example is the track used while the tractor is plowing through the field, really keeping you on the edge of your seat the entire time. And fun fact, is that some of the music was even being scored for scenes that had yet to be completed. Music writer Jerry Goldsmith would often get sent black and white scenes from the film that weren't even finished, and had to phone the studio to ask them what exactly was going on. Along with your typical orchestra, there's also the beautiful vocal track called Flying Dreams, which is sung by Sally Stevens in the film whilst Timmy has been given his medicine, and then sung again by Paul Williams over the end credits. Alright, let's take a look at the characters. For the most part, I thought they were fine. Mrs. Brisby is a solid character, she's likeable, confident, and her soft-spoken voice makes her feel very wholesome. Forgive me for disturbing you, but my son's life is in great danger. I also like the character of Mr. Ages, as he can come across as a bit hostile, but you know he's a good person at heart. I like it when you get good characters on screen who can also possess poor social traits. Kind of makes them feel more real in a sense. Once again. Oh, shoo, shoo, shoo. Go on now. Go on. Thank you so much. 
And that goes for the same with Auntie Shrew. She comes along as an almost villainous-like character with her pompous attitude, which kind of reminds me of Coella de Vil from 101 Dalmatians. But as the film goes on, you see that she is in fact a good person, even putting her life at risk to help Brisby stop the tractor. One character I didn't really like, however, was the Crow Jeremy. I just didn't really see the point of him in the film. Yeah, I get that he's the comedy relief, but I hate it when it's obvious that the comedy relief character is just purely there for the comedy. He doesn't really serve the plot at all, and every time he appears, the whole pacing just comes to a standstill as we have to hear about him being a clumsy idiot. Even at the end of the film when he's assigned the task to get a lot of string for the big move, he doesn't even bring it along until the very end after it's all happened. Not saying I hated this character, I just wish he could have been better integrated into the plot. It really did feel like he was an afterthought, put in just to keep the kids a bit happier. I mean Christ, even that big alligator with pink lips had more impact on the plot in All Dogs Go to Heaven than this crow did. Let's make music together. <laughs> Let's, Let's make, make sweet harmony. harmony. Again, seriously, what the fuck? So, in conclusion. Don Bluth and his team departed from Disney in order to make something that they felt would restore animation back to its glory. Do I think they succeeded? Yeah. Yeah, I do. For the time period, animated films were indeed starting to take a hit. You can clearly see the quality difference when comparing these two Disney films side by side. And I think Secret of Nim is definitely a step up for the time. It has great animation, strong characters, and a more mature and compelling story. And you can definitely feel the hard work and dedication that went into making it. The final cost of the film was about $6.3 million. Don Bluth and the producers at Aurora Productions even mortgaged their homes in order to have the film completed, with the hope that the film would be the success they wanted it to be. And was the film a success? Mm, moderately, yeah. It made back $14 million, and bearing in mind the film wasn't really marketed that well, and only saw a release in limited theatres, plus the fact it was going up against E.T., I'd say that's pretty successful. Successful enough that it saw Don Bluth and his team go on to make other animated features for the future. I'd say, go check out The Secret of Nim. It offers good story, good characters, and great animation.